Hey everyone, it is August 10, 2015. I'm Renee Ritchie, and right now we're going to talk about rumors of a new iPhone event, rumors of a new iPhone, and all the rest of the Apple news. This is the iMore Show. Joining me this week, we have Serenity Caldwell in her brand new studio with her brand new stuff. How are you, Ren? Hello, I'm doing swell. Um, the power is back on in my lovely suburb of Boston, Massachusetts. I'm very happy about this. You lost all the power last week. I did. I lost the power for 48 hours and I was very unhappy. Uh, How does that happen? Like the modern world, it just feels like you should always have power. Yes, you would think. Unfortunately, the vast majority of uh, large cities and, and smaller cities alike uh, use these things called telephone poles and they <laughs> connect the power lines up there. And unfortunately, if you're also in a suburb that happens to be heavy with trees and you get hit by a microburst where 75 mile an hour winds decide to fell those trees onto power lines, terrible things happen. Like like cutting me off from power for 48 hours. So, so there's <laughs> there's no there's no truth to the rumor that Massachusetts simply did not pay the bill? Ah, uh, ha, ha. No, no. Thankfully not. I, was, I used to live in California. I already had one of those. <laughs> well, it's funny. I, I, the city I used to work in, uh, Westmount, they actually paid to have all the power cables put underground. And then they realized that the power coming to them was not underground. No. <laughs> so it went out. I mean, it, it was super solid and stable there, but it, it still went out when, when the big storms hit. Yeah. I do like the idea of undergrounding cables. It's just, it's such a, it's such a immense task that I worry about the financial cost and whether taxpayers would ever, would ever submit to it, which makes, you know, founding new cities really easy because new cities are like, yeah, let's bury everything. Fiber optic cable. Let's do some new cities. That would be awesome. Yeah. Let's, uh, how, how's none of it? Can we like, can yeah. we? raise the temperature maybe a little bit like as the ice caps melt can we done live in in the northernmost canadian province done let's do that all right oh, that'll be awesome i'm more i'm more 2040 is in none of it and that's not just the temperature anymore no <laughs> all right so uh interesting week ren uh we've We've pretty much Apple for the last three, maybe four years has held their uh, iPhone event during the second week of September. So surprise, surprise. Once again, we have rumors and reports of an iPhone event being held the second week in September. Shocked? Mm -hmm. Shocked are you? I am so not shocked. <laughs> I honestly, uh, this is pretty much wrote since I started working for uh, Macworld and, and now I'm more, this is, that's the week. In fact, I think Renee, you put, when you were making a page for the new iPhone, uh, the next, the next generation iPhone, you're like on or around <laughs> September 8th. Yeah. So, I mean, Apple can always change its mind. Apple can decide, you know what? We're going to take an 18 month cycle for this. People have their big phones. We don't need to iterate further, uh, but more often than not, they're probably going to keep to their 12 month cycle. Yeah, I think I think actually it's news now when they don't, because I remember right before WBDC 2011, when they knew it was going to take 16 months to get the iPhone 4S and iOS, I forget which one, then iOS 5, iOS 6, whatever, shipped on that ready. You started getting people going, don't expect any new hardware at WWDC. <laughs> so they were sort of softening that news. And there's been no indication of them doing that this year. No, in fact, uh, if anything, I feel like the rumor mill has churned upwards. Um, we've gotten all kinds of, you know, potentials of what the new iPhone may or may not have, what sizes it will come in, you know, what chips will it be it will be under the hood? Will it have forced touch? Uh, oh. So, you know, I, I definitely think that it is not unreasonable to see <laughs> a new iPhone in September and probably a new Apple TV because let's face it, it's been so. Uh, yeah, to the, uh, March 2012. The, my favorite story of last week, I complained about it on Twitter because it was just, it was just, I couldn't take it anymore. Uh, it was a report from a financial analyst who's usually pretty liable who said that the iPhone 6S is delayed, but will still come out on time. <laughs> and it got, it got front page news on a lot of Apple sites. I just don't know how to handle that world. It's the parts to make up the success have been delayed, but they're still going to have the event and yeah. ship on time. Who cares? <laughs> I don't need to worry about this. Well, it doesn't affect consumers uh, day to day. And honestly, it doesn't affect the majority of users. With the exception of the small advanced crowd, those kind of reports are maybe marginally useful for the stock exchange crowd. 
I feel like it's like you like, it, like at least once every couple of years you see Tim Cook as explosions are going off, leaping across the factory floor and pushing the last uh, DLC cover drill bit into place, <laughs> sort of like Tom Cruise. Well done, the done, the and like we just never know. Like they do all these things every year to make sure an iPhone just shows up on or around the 18th of September, and they could have crisis after crisis for all we know. They could pull out uh, sapphire displays, let's spitball at the last minute, and yeah. we still get our iPhones. I mean, I I do think that there's probably marginal news uh, newsworthiness from a Wall Street perspective if Wall Street wants to see, you know, how well is your shipping supply, you know, your supply chain running. But at the same time, I don't necessarily think that's major news for your average user. And on top of that, you know what, unless there's been a big fall down in manufacturing compliancy and how it's all built, like unless Apple's like, yeah, we couldn't get our sapphire in time, so instead we're making the displays with plastic. <laughs> like that's that's news. That's we're putting out the iPhone on time, but we're putting out substandard substandard parts to yeah. get it out on time. That's sacrificing quality for for a release date. But until Apple decides to do that, I don't really care if they ran into a snag on their shipping line if the product is still going to show up as needed. Yeah, I'm assuming there's like 900 million snags every year, and they just yeah. You want to you want to know the the snag that I want to know about is where where are the modern buckles? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah they changed get, the leather apparently. Get your get your reporting your track team onto the <laughs> modern buckles. Tell me why I can't buy a brown modern buckle yet. Yeah, solve the real problems that people like Serenity <laughs> are facing every day. Well, if you're gonna report silly news, at least report silly news that interests me. That's, <laughs> that that's people all care I'm about. <laughs> So what are we expecting? I guess an iPhone 6S, an iPhone 6S Plus, you mentioned the new Apple TV and John Pachowski from now from, I almost said from Rico, but now from BuzzFeed is saying we might see the iPads early this year as well. iPads, iPads. I'm curious about this, especially given how much, in, like how much was placed on iOS 9 being really awesome for iPads. I feel like iPhones and an Apple TV, assuming that there's a, something to show for the Apple TV, would take up the normal two-hour slot. You take an hour for the iPhones, you take an hour for the Apple TV. But it may just be that there's not um, there's not enough content or inf- interesting things about the Apple TV to devote an entire hour to it. I mean, as we remember, the September event last year was mostly about this thing. Yeah, you know, they were like, oh yeah, they're they're new iPhones. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, and that took what forty five minutes. And then I'll watch all the time. And then I'll watch all the time. So I could I could definitely see them splitting it up as 45, 45, 30. Is my well, they, could, they could just yada yada the iPads because there is the, the whiz bang new features. But otherwise, Apple A9 processors and you're kind of done. I mean, unless they put out the iPad Pro, but that doesn't sound like a September release. Well, and that's, that's my question is if there's going to be an iPad Pro or a larger iPad this year, does it make sense to launch it later than all of the other iPads? Does it make sense to separate it? Maybe they're going to launch it with Macs and make it a Mac focused event and then introduce the iPad Pro as like the future of the computing, the tablet computing Mac. I don't know. Like more like Mac than mobile. Yeah, exactly. Like it may have a touch screen and you may interact with it, but we consider it more of a Mac than a than an iOS device. I don't know. I honestly I honestly do not know, and it's a little stumping to me because I, I feel like there are a couple of options. Either there's no iPad Pro this year and people are just mouthing off. Um, there may, may, they may never be an iPad Pro outside of the research labs. Um, there may be an iPad Pro, but it's introduced as more of a Mac than an iPad. Or there's an iPad Pro and iPads aren't actually coming in September and they're going to come in October or whenever they decide to release their iPad Pro. Yeah, because otherwise people getting an iPad Air 3 and then just a month later seeing an iPad Pro on the market could be mad. Yeah, I that's yeah. I don't I I feel like the then the market is close and you know how who who is buying an iPad right now? We've got children buying iPads, we've got college students buying iPads. Federico Vatici. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Vatici buying iPads and we've got businesses buying iPads. And if businesses are all flocked to the iPad Air 3 and then Apple's like, just kidding, here's something that's actually useful for your business and also a touch screen. I feel like people would be upset. And, you know, there's precedent. Apple, Apple has definitely introduced iPads and then obsoleted them months later. So there's definitely precedent, but I'm, I'm kind of hoping that that doesn't happen. 
Yeah, and we haven't heard Force, much that we've heard Force Touch rumors for the iPhone and for the iPad Pro, we have not, as far as I can tell, heard Force Touch rumors for the standard everyday iPad mini and iPad Air. Not so much, which surprises me. I, I wouldn't be too shocked to find out that the iPad mini wasn't getting Force Touch this time around since it's kind of traditionally lagged behind its older, bigger siblings. But no Force Touch on the iPad seems very odd to me, especially given how much of iOS 9 has the potential to really hook into and utilize Force Touch. Also gaming, you know, if they put out a Force Touch API, which there there is, you know, if there's a Force Touch API out there for iOS, that opens up a whole wide avenue of really awesome gaming. And for them to introduce that to the iPhone and then leave it out of the, the big iPad seems like a mistake. Yeah, it's super interesting because it's not, it's an S year for the phones, but the iPads sort of have these cycles too, and they're not made as clear because Apple doesn't use the same S nomenclature, but the iPad Air 2 is already an iPad Air 1 made thinner with an Apple AA processor that's ridiculously powerful and two gigabytes of RAM. So where you go with an iPad Air 3, it's already got two gigabytes of RAM. You go to three, it's already got an A8, you put an A9 in there, it's just faster. It doesn't seem like there's a big conversation there without something like Force Press, Force Touch. Yeah, Absolutely. And that brings us to the iPads, the i sorry, the iPhones 6s. Rumors again, Force Touch, better camera, uh, Apple A9 processor, more gigabytes of RAM. Um, how much of an event does that fill? I mean, the camera demo usually takes a while. Yeah. Force Press could be a, a whole a whole segment. But I can't. Regardless, I can't see it taking upwards of an hour. You know, once upon a time, the iPhone events took hours but they were almost always coupled with something yeah and last year we had the big and bigger and bigger was the big story so they could talk about screens and about their uh their special new dual mode uh isp panels and for what was it, focus pixels focus and pixels focus pixels are really cool oh they are we got a whole diagram on them i just don't if they don't do the depth perception cameras like it sounds like they're not doing with this run I, what is the segment is it a bigger megapixel camera maybe are they doing anything cool with uh taking photos and then doing pixel reduction to improve clarity i, I i'm guessing there's going to be a whole bunch of processor stuff in the story yeah i imagine it'll be very processor intensive and also very software intensive apple's picked up a, i mean apple every year picks up a couple of up-and-coming photo companies um, but they don't necessarily need to do a lot of external changing to add new and awesome features to their camera. Right now, Apple has a whole bunch of manual camera options built into its APIs, but its, its camera, like its camera app, mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily take advantage of those, which may not be a bad thing. I mean, your average consumer doesn't know what an f-stop is, let alone why they would want to change it. Um, or uh, shutter speed for that matter. But at the same time, I'm like, I could I could do with their like their little sun slider getting a, a little bit of a revamp um, as well as we could see even better burst control. We could see automatic GIFs, um, which is something that of course yes. Google Photos out, rolled out pretty, pretty recently. Uh, we could see greater light penetration and better stop motion um any honestly like or stop motion uh slow motion we could see stop motion for that matter we could see we could see a version of the time lapse camera that's controllable that's manually controllable rather than just it automatically figuring out what what speed you want there there are a lot of there are a lot of little things that they could play with and make big deals of on stage yeah, and Force Press is still really interesting to me because it exists so differently on the Apple Watch and on the I'm on the MacBook trackpad. And I'd kind of like um, a hybrid approach. I wouldn't mind if all those option, you know, dot 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 uh, menu buttons on the uh, on the music app, for example, were hidden behind Force Press context menus, like a right click menu, the way you are on the Apple Watch. But I also want the sort of pressure sensitive drawing modes that are sort of implied in the Mac trackpad. Yeah, I mean, you know what? The Notes app in iOS 9 already has hints of it uh, with all of the different tools that you can use to draw. All it's missing is a little bit of pressure. Come on, <laughs> Apple, please, please. Do it. Yeah, so it's going to be an interesting uh, event. It's, again, supposed to be September 9th, could be September 8th. Apple's usually pretty good about that. Um, and I, I don't know what else sort of to expect. There are rumors. Some people really want 4K in the video camera, and they really want 4K support on Apple TV. But the bandwidth infrastructure for an iTunes 4K just isn't really there yet. And the content doesn't seem to really be there yet. It's not there from a professional side. And also, if you're asking for 4K video from a consumer camera, it's certainly possible. But just like the really low par 
HD camera, like the iPhone 3GS and stuff like that. Just like the, they could shoot, you know, a very low 720, 1080p. Um, 4K, you're, you're requiring to basically blow up the pixels to an extent where the video quality just isn't going to look as good as you would expect an iPhone camera to look. Like I would, um, one of the things that sort of makes me really happy that Apple sort of stays within boundaries on their megapixel limit, um, as well as doesn't rush into these games right away, is that they really do care about increasing the photo and video quality. If they uh, if they went from 720 to 1080p, but your light levels were still the same, like you yeah. would still, if you shot in low light, it would look completely black. That's not an improvement in Apple's eyes. Okay, great. I can I can show someone the same black picture in slightly bigger on a slightly bigger screen. Uh, that said, I do think they will probably boost megapixels in the next camera if solely so that you can use iphone pictures to properly uh, wallpaper a 4k screen yeah and it'd be nice if they did it without without sacrificing the size of those pixels because they've always had really good i forget what it is in the latest camera one point something um but it, it's always been really good and really big and one of the biggest problems with getting higher megapixels is they just chop up the pixels to make them smaller they bring in less light and you get noisier photos and i, and I hope that's not the way they go yeah, like I was saying before, I, Apple is very passionate about photography, probably more passionate about photography than they are music in certain circles, certain circles. And for them to take a downgrade in picture quality just to make the picture itself bigger does not seem like an Apple move at all. Yeah, no, I agree. So wait and see. Uh, Apple TV, anything else you're looking forward to there, Ren, besides, oh, please, the updated interface finally. Updated interface, Apple Music support, please. Um is it odd too that we're waiting on that? Like they didn't just roll that into the current version? No, because that goes into, and maybe we can save this for our Apple Music talk, but that goes into how I feel about Apple Music in general, which is that, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's, it may not be labeled as a beta, but they're kind of treating these first three months as a, all right, let's identify all the books. And I think to add another networked device might be a little tricky, especially with Sonos and a lot of the other connected speakers not offering Apple Music support yet. It might just be one of those things tied all together. Also, um, speaking as somebody who's currently running a variety of machines on various operating systems, having the Apple TV still running Discovery D and dealing with all of those crazy networking issues, I have been almost unable to stream anything via AirPlay to it from an iOS 9 or an iOS 8.4 device. That's weird because I, I have all those Discovery D issues, but it still works for me. And I was kind of, I was joking around with Mark Edwards and Seth Clifford saying, can you imagine if Independence Day was happening now and Jeff Goldblum tried to hack into the alien ship and it was like mothership bracket four bracket, mothership bracket five bracket, can't get connection. And then just the world ends. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. That, that needs to go away. And the responder, our old, old friend, mm -hmm. I, I want to get him a cup of cocoa and just put him on the sofa and tell him how much I love him. Yeah. Remember when John Gruber used to write these uh, back and forths uh, back in, I want to say the 2006, yeah. 2007, he used to do back and forth with Mac, Mac and windows. And he also did a back and forth with brushed metal and its replacement. Yeah. Uh, I kind of, I kind of want a lone, a lone detective story about discovery D. Nice. Uh, all right, so that is September. This is now, Ren. Do you want to transition into Apple Music a little bit? Yeah, let's talk Apple Music. Because um, well, we right. haven't done that enough lately. No, we definitely haven't. So we have a book coming out very soon uh, that will talk all things Apple Music. If you're having problems with Apple Music or if you just want to understand more how the service works, how to take best advantage of it on your iOS devices and your Macs and hopefully soon your Apple TVs. We're putting out a book uh, for $5. It's available for pre-order now from the iMore.com website and from the iTunes store, I guess the iBook store technically. Um, so I'm I'm really excited that we're going to be able to get that out. In general, uh, like I was saying a couple minutes ago, Apple Music continues to work really well for me. And it seems to work really well for a lot of other people and really terribly for a very vocal segment of the population. Uh, I don't want to discount that segment at all because I really do think that it's, you know, it's it's unfortunate and it's frustrating to have your collection uh, tinkered with when you turn on Apple Music and all of a sudden songs on other auxiliary devices aren't the songs that you're expecting or the art, album artwork isn't uploading correctly on your other devices. That's frustrating. That's absolutely frustrating. Um, 
But like I was saying before, I really do think that this initial foray into Apple Music, I wish they had labeled it a beta. It makes me mad that they didn't up enable it or uh, label it a beta, but it feels like a beta. You know, it, it feels like, okay, let's let's put this out. We we did all the work we can. We're tweaking it every week. And you know what? Zane Lowe on Beats 1 pretty much says as much about Beats 1 where he's like, yep, we put this all together in like 14 weeks and every week is a new adventure and we're constantly tweaking and constantly changing. We're adding new things. You know, they added full show replays. Um, a few weeks after I was like, oh, there's probably label restrictions onto why they can't use do th full show replays. And you know what? There could have been. There could have been and it could have gotten smoothed over as Apple's like, hey, see how many subscribers we have? You want to give us that. That'll it'll help you get even more. Come on. So I, I really do think that it's a work in progress and an evolutionary process, but that doesn't change the fact that it stinks that Apple didn't label it as such. Yeah, it, it should have been a beta. Yeah, I think free is the quote unquote term for a free trial is a quote unquote term for a new beta. And it's the wide range of issues. And it seems people like me, people who just don't have music and just want to stream stuff and use Siri have the best time because it's just instant access to any music you want. And people who had meticulously crafted you know, thousands upon thousands of songs with with metadata accumulated over years had the worst time. But there's also a big disparity. People who don't use I think have an easier time too, because Apple Music, as potentially confusing and confounding as it is, still seems to be more functional where iTunes is just one more layer on top of things. And it's not clear, like I've been writing those tutorials this weekend, and it's really forced me to take another in-depth look at iTunes. And there's there's those more buttons are just everywhere. And like there's a heart next to a more button that has a heart in it. And when you when you download a song or cache a song, I don't know how to remove it without, what if I just want to remove it from cash, but not from Apple Music or from my collection? It, it, it just doesn't seem, like it seems like there's too much of some stuff, not enough of others. Yeah, it's a mess. It's really a mess. iTunes um, is big, it's bloated, it's filled with legacy code, and that's going to be really, uh, really frustrating to most consumers to be able to sort of dig through to get what they want. Um, I was just having this problem earlier today when I was shuffle. I was trying to shuffle an artist. Um, I looked up Darwin D's on Apple Music and I'm like, I just want to listen to his, his catalog. Um, and I was trying to find a list of just all songs that it would shuffle through. And I had to go through top songs and click a sub menu. And I finally found, it. but it's stuff like that where it's, it shouldn't be this complicated Apple. I should just be able to. Also, I, that's a, that's a wish list feature for OS 10.10 or 10, 11, excuse me, um, is the, you know, I, I would love to be able to type into spotlight, play all songs by, or shuffle all songs by Darwin D's, just like I can command it to Siri because I end up using, uh, Apple music on my iPhone a lot more than Apple music on the Mac, on the Mac. So it was primarily because Apple music on the Mac is just such a cluster with iTunes being as messy as it is. But I, I use Siri so much with this that it doesn't make sense to me to try and manually type in and find all of the stuff from iTunes when I can just get it all on my iPhone. Yeah, no, um, I, I agree completely. And I don't know, like I said several times, I don't know what the fix is for this because saying they should tear down iTunes and rebuild it, like e even if that was absolutely possible, that's a huge endeavor and how long would it take and what would the consequences be? Or if they should make I Apple music simpler. If they just pull stuff out, where are they going to put it and how are people going to move back and forth? And there's, it's all, it's almost like we're, we're we're paying now. We're all suffering for years and years of this stuff just getting to the way it is. And mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a clear way. For, I mean, obviously they have to fix. Do you think, Ren, if they just fixed the bugs, it would be livable enough for whatever comes next? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I still, I still feel like there's too much legacy code. That kind of iTunes needs to be burned to the ground and started over. Yeah, maybe in parallel. Like I think you have to keep iTunes while you build something else, almost like a bridge. I don't think I've used this analogy before. Like you got to keep that bridge moving between the city as you build the better tunnel underneath it. Yeah, it's a, it's the old Bay Bridge. iTunes yeah. is the old Bay Bridge in San Francisco. No, I mean we've seen Apple take on extensive reorganizations of their old programs before. You know, uh, we saw it with iMovie and GarageBand first. Then it moved over to the iWork suite. Then we got Photos. It, you know begs to reason that iTunes is next in that list of let's fix this and rewrite it from the ground up so that it's not terrible. 
Yeah, I I agree with that completely. And I just think there's going to be, there's a lot of pain in those people. And some people say, oh, it's just noisy internet geeks who are complaining, or it's just super users who are complaining. But those users count, those edge cases count, and you have to make it work great for everybody. Or you have to literally do what you did with uh, Final Cut Pro or iMovie and create that other app that has that limited experience so that you disclude the people for whom you are no longer servicing. Absolutely. <sighs> All right, Ren. Other rumors are a new iMac, and people have found references to a, a, a 21.5 inch iMac with a 4K screen, not 5K, like 27 inch, but 4K, which I think would be effectively the same density on the smaller screen mm -hmm. size. This sounds totally rational, reasonable, and actually good to me. Yep, not surprised in one one iota. I would love to see a smaller iMac in part because I like my smaller iMac and I would really love a retina screen. That would be swell. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I feel like it's a logical conclusion. Apple Apple wants to retinize its entire line of laptops and desktops and this is the next step. And displays have been getting, 4K displays have been getting more and more inexpensive. So it makes sense to be able to afford to put it in the smaller model. I was incompetent and forgot to do the ad before we switched to Mac, so I'm going to do that now. Okay. <laughs> the iMore Show is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business technology and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash iMore. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash iMore. So what is lynda.com? Lynda.com is for problem solvers, for the curious, for people who want to make things happen. Maybe you want to, I don't know, master the new version of Office learn negotiating tactics, build a website, get in on the ground floor of the new creative suite, or you just go to lynda.com and you will feed your curious mind. One of my favorite things about lynda.com is that software is always changing and it's annoying. People do not like change. As much as we get bored, we do not like change because it is different, it is harder, and it is confusing. But lynda.com brings together industry experts and they sort of help you through that change hump. So for example, there is a new version of Office for Mac. There is a new version of Adobe Creative Suite. There is a new version uh, of all these different software products that you use every day, and they get the best people in the world to sit down and show you how to use it. Uh, they have weekly office workshop. They have going paperless start to finish. They have iPhone and iPad security fundamentals. They have growth hacking fundamentals. They have almost anything you can imagine. They have courses on photography and they get them up fast. Uh, almost certainly when things launch, if not soon after the launch, they have those courses live. So here's what you can do. You can watch and learn from top experts who are passionate about teaching. You can stream thousands of video courses on demand and learn at your own schedule. You, your courses are structured so you can watch them from start to finish or consume, consume them in bite-sized pieces. You can browse each course transcript to follow along or search for answers or skip to that point in the video. You can take notes and go back and refer to them later. You can download tutorials and watch them on iOS or Android. You can create and save playlists. And of course, you can watch, customize your learning path, share with friends, colleagues, or team members. There are a lot of places I know where they just get their company uh, or their institution a Linda membership so that everybody can learn and just do better work for that company. So once again, your lynda.com membership will give you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. So whether you're looking to become an industry expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, go to lynda.com slash iMore and sign up for your free 10-day trial. That's lynda.com slash iMore. The closest thing you can get to jacking straight into the matrix and learning Kung Fu. Thanks, Linda. All right, Ren, sorry, I, <laughs> I stopped this mid-Mac. That's all right. Uh, one of the questions we're getting a ton of this time, and I'm actually not sure how to answer that, is uh, Intel started launching Skylake, which is the processor that comes after Broadwell, which was not a good launch for them, going down to 14 nanometers. Not so they, much. <laughs> they were slow. They couldn't get stuff out. Apple ended up having to launch the 15-inch MacBook Pro, still on Haswell. Um, and now Broadwell is not finished rolling out and they've got Skylake already. So uh, people are wondering, Apple already refreshed the MacBooks this year, but is there an outside chance we could see a second refresh cycle, something with Skylake, uh, maybe for the 15 inch MacBook Pro, maybe even for the other MacBook Pros? I don't know, honestly. I feel like um, <sighs> Intel and Apple have always had kind of a little bit of a roughshod relationship. And I'm wondering if this latest sort of not mishap, I won't call it a mishap, but it's, I, I wonder if that's made things more fraught, you know? Uh, yeah, no, I, well, I think that's true. I think 
it was so hard getting down to 14 nanometer. And now Skylake is an architecture change. It's not a die shrink again. I mean, they're trying to get to 10 nanometers, but I think they're going to need Ant-Man to do it. I don't know if there's any other way. Yeah, they but need little tiny welders on their chips. They got to go into the quantum realm. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is just an architecture switch. And they might end up, instead of doing TikTok, is doing TikTok talk and doing three generations of 14 nanometer. But the big deal here is power efficiency. So if they put them into the iMac, I mean, that's great. Um, there will be advantages, but if they get them into the MacBooks, that's where you start to get extra hours of battery life, which is really good and, and a lot more power. And that's something that the MacBooks direly need. Um, the the new extra super thin MacBook is awesome, but as we've seen from the tear down pictures, it's almost completely batteries, and it's still only what ten to twelve hours of battery life, which is really more like four to eight of active battery life if you're doing if you're multitasking, if you're not just using it kind of single window. Um, and while that's still, you know, a, a fair amount of battery life, it, um, it's not quite to the extent where I feel comfortable buying a, a one port MacBook. Yeah. It's so funny. Cause I remember when they first introduced, I think it was the air that got the big battery or no, it was the, the built-in battery on the MacBook pros at, at one of the Mac worlds. And they just announced these battery lives. And you were like, wow, more than four hours. And now and, we're spoiled. <laughs> yeah. And now like, it feels like nine or 12 is just not enough because you, it's, it's almost like the iPad problem. I plug my iPhone in every night. So I know it's always charged, but my iPad, it lasts so long. I forget to plug it in and then it, 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 it runs out. And I don't expect it. And that's where I'm getting at with MacBooks now is they, I'm used to them just lasting and lasting all of a sudden. It's, oh my God, I'm in the red. What do I do? Yeah. You're panicking all of a sudden. You're like, but this, but this machine, when I was, so uh, when I had my power outage, my horrible, horrible power outage, um, my iPad, thank God I had charged completely before. And I, I used my, my laptop to charge it the last little bit. And that iPad was my only connection to the wired world because my my phone, you know, I was using it from 6 a.m. So by three or four, it was starting to peter out and I started plugging in my external batteries to it. And when it finally, you know, got close to giving up the ghost, I'm just like, all right, I'm going iPad only. And I went iPad only for the rest of the time. And that was that was fine because I had thank thank goodness I had the cellular connection. But that that machine lasted me very long until the power came back on. Yeah, that is uh, that is interesting because when we talk about things like the iPad Pro and these new the new MacBook, to some extent, these are devices that are starting to blur the lines. Like the MacBook is sort of like an iPad that splits open in the middle and has a keyboard, and the iPad Pro is sort of going to be like an iPad that's scaled up to a Mac size. And you start thinking about the battery life and the implications, and we're getting to a point where I think this is a dangerous point because when you had to charge them all the time, you were always ready to charge them. And if you never had to charge them, or didn't have to charge them for months, you wouldn't really worry about it. Mm -hmm. But just in terms of human attention span, the danger zone seems to be between 10 and 20 hours for me. Yeah, it's a little bit much. It's just not, a, not too little, not, too, not, not enough, but danger zone. All right, so uh, Apple Pay. I wanted to bring up Apple Pay, Ren, because I finally got it. You finally got to play with it. Your Amex card, right? It's finally, finally, finally available, but not yeah. officially available in Canada. No, so Apple Pay is not available in Canada, but what happened is, and I'll bring it up here and try and show everybody. What happened is, oh, Twister. Yeah, we can uh, see it. They, what happened is American Express decided to support corporate cards. And because Mobile Nations is an American company, my Mobile Nations Amex, uh, corporate Amex, is, is an American card. So the minute that happened, I started chatting with all the other Canadians here. And I was like, I'm trying it, I'm trying it, I'm going in. And they were trying it too. And I added it with no problem, but it, it wanted to use my Mobile Nations email address as an authenticator. And just the email never came. And it never came. And I tried again. And Dirk was trying at the same time. And it never came. And then eventually it arrived. And then I added it to my iPhone my Apple watch and then that never, but then eventually about three hours later, all the emails were here. It was added and it is glorious. So did you run out and buy a bunch of things? No, it took so long. I ended up running into meetings, but I'm going to do that right afterwards. I already warned, I already warned our bosses that there's going to be a lot of stuff from the dollar menu charged on that Amex today. A lot of 99 cent burgers and fries. Yeah, but I'm interested to try it because we don't officially have Apple pay here, but it theoretically works. We have tap to pay everywhere, like NFC payments everywhere. I buy my gas that way. I shop at department stores that way. Uh, restaurants, uh, sit down restaurants, you usually have to use the pit, pin and chip because mm -hmm. they bring it to your table. But when you go to like a counter-based restaurant, you can almost always, or like, a, like a, a coffee shop that's not Starbucks, you can almost always just tap to pay. Uh, so I'm looking really forward to the shocked and odd looks of all these people as I just tap the watch and sort of smirk and walk out. It's gonna yeah. be glorious. Mm -hmm. 
You'd be like, wait, what? What did you do? I know I'm I'm really curious to find out what uh what companies and merchants are unofficially supporting Apple Pay in, in Canada. Because I really like the idea of how to secretly use Apple Pay in Canada. Yeah, well, I'm like I, I've, I've said the story before, but a couple of singletons ago, I picked up our mutual American friends at the airport, and I stopped to get gas on the way back, and I just tapped my wallet and got in the car, and they were like, "What is this Canadian magic?" And that was before Apple Pay, so tap to pay was sort of weird for everybody. But that's just how we've been for the last five years, how we've always been, and not having Apple Pay in this land of NFC plenty has been galling. So uh, having having it and at least trying it, um, I'm super psyched. I hope it works. I'll be super sad if it doesn't run. Fingers crossed. I think but it will. Crying think... bitter NFC tears. you will just be like, why? Just mashing your, your wrist against the NFC terminal. Why won't you work? Yeah, seen from office space. Yes. Yeah, NFC terminal parts everywhere. No. Uh, security hysteria was something else I wanted to touch on. It seems like in August, uh, everyone gets bored, realizes Black Hat Conference is on, starts to read the speaker uh, subjects, and then throws Apple any headline they can goes crazy yeah they well they just love to say oh the unbreakable system has been broken when in every now, time I, all right malware exists malware exists on all platforms apple has not been shy in saying that malware exists what apple says is we are probably the most secure system because of xyz and all of these other things that we do and that is correct most of the malware exploits against apple are either done by downloading really sketchy stuff that the average user would not download or they require someone being physically in front of your machine, which is a great reason to have a password, <laughs> by the way. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not that these things don't exist. It's that they're much, much more difficult and much rarer than on a Windows environment. And I just, I hate the, I hate the inflammatory, your Mac is doomed. Yeah, well, the headline is, this was CNBC saying hackers were stealing your data, and it was based off of um, a known mask attack exploit. And unfortunately, because it was CNBC, it got picked up by, I think, Forbes and uh, maybe a couple other MSN or something, a couple other networks. And it was ludicrously wrong. Um, Apple had already patched most of mask attack in iOS 8.1.3. They suggested earlier versions, if you hadn't upgraded, were susceptible. But it turns out Apple has patched those as well. So no one is really at risk of the mask attack, which was an app, for example, replacing Facebook and conning you into using it instead of Facebook, and then intercepting the traffic. And like it was counting on you, first of all, like installing an app, not from the app store, and then agreeing to trust it in the first place, and then not realizing that it was a fake app that didn't have any of your real data in it, because they couldn't pull real data. That's so it was, cool. yeah, it was hard to begin with. And now that it's, it doesn't really work, you have to have like two versions of Facebook, and you have to go there and physically download it off a weird store, or someone like you said, has to have physical access to your phone, and delete your other Facebook app and push this on. And it's just, it's just not a risk for 99.9% .9 of the people. But my mom called me again and she was watching CNBC, God knows why. And she's like, oh, is my, is my, is my, sorry, my iPhone hackable? Am I in danger? No, you're in danger from CNBC, not from hackers. Yeah, stop watching CNBC. Stop yeah, we had CNBC. Well, no, I mean, it's, 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 again, it's the same problem I had with Market Watch is it's their job to vet the stuff before they report it. Um, the researchers just want just want to get well known and they want the headlines, but it's the job of CNBC and other outlets to sanity check them. Well, and there's nothing wrong with reporting saying these researchers have been able to expose a flaw, but you can't market it as the world is going to end. You have to be frank and just be like, all right, here's what I've, it's about safety, not about hype. And I think that's the that's the big thing for technology in general is we can't be going around um, scaring users. It may be good for page views, but ultimately it's not good for our society. And it's not good for, you know, more and more of our tech, more and more of our lives are, are, are relying on technology. Our cars have more and more technology, you know, our, you know, medical devices have technology now. And if users are constantly afraid that that technology are houses, you know, if that people are afraid that that technology is going to be hacked into, um, they're not going to use it or they're going to use it poorly. So I feel like education and safety is so much more important than scaremongering. And there, there are ways that we can be great publications and do that and, you know, help educate our users and get lots of page views in the process. It is possible 
um, you can you can be helpful and also make money. It's it's a fact. It's uh, and what's really bad about this is that it is chicken little and and crying wolf. And then when there is a serious exploit, you just people have gotten desensitized to it, and you can't inform them because they'll be skeptical based on your prior track record. So it, it generally does a disservice to everybody. And it's sort of like the additional Apple Pay stuff this week. There were two surveys that came out. One that said Apple Pay usage was on the way up, and one that said Apple Pay usage was on the way down. And the one that said it was on the way up in the U.S. said where the data came from, how many people were sampled, and basically everything that you'd expect in a survey, and then had comments from the surveyors on how they were interpreting that data. And the other one, the one that says Apple Pay was going down, had no such uh, information on how the data was collected. It was sort of a, uh, an off-the-cuff narrative based on being at a conference with their buddies. And then, oh, by the way, we asked this guy who runs Loop Pay what he thought of Apple Pay and didn't disclose that Loop Pay is currently owned by Samsung and he's actually a Samsung employee. Such and a and we'll ask the PayPal guy while he's here. And oh, what's poor Apple going to do? Because this is a miserable failure. And that I feel again is doing a disservice to your readership. Absolutely. And another major publication did that. I mean, it's just uh, I'm canceling my subscriptions to everything, man. <laughs> Not everything. Just uh, I, I am going to, if I can find it, I am going to take one more short break and tell you about our second sponsor. And that is, wait for it, wait for it. That is Smile Software, one of my favorites. I love the people at Smile because they make stuff that actually makes my life better. And one of those things is Text Expander 5. It helps me type faster by making suggestions of frequently typed phrases to abbreviate and save time. So if it notices, for example, uh, I'm typing TC a lot, it might just automatically say, that should be Tim Cook. Or if I'm typing Tim Cook a lot, make an abbreviation and then we'll fill that in for you. And then when I have to type out, these live blogs and things just makes my life easier, but it does that with my address. I'm gonna type that off and email addresses, almost everything. And then it syncs those snippets to multiple devices, storing them on iCloud Drive or Dropbox. I'm currently using Dropbox because I set it up before iCloud Drive was available and hey, it works. You can set a hotkey for inline search. Like for example, when I post these podcasts, I type P uh, for podcast and the name of the show and it fills in everything and all I have to do is change the episode number in the description and that post is done and I do that for all the podcasts it saves me a tremendous amount of work and I have that for a bunch of common post types and you can even create fill in snippets to personalize with standard repetitive replies you can do them almost like forms. Text Expander 5 has support for JavaScript, which also works in Text Expander Touch for iPad and iPhone. I mean, the list of reasons for using this just goes on and on and on and on. It is one of the most valuable pieces of software. I see you nodding, Ren. You like it too? Yes, I love it. Text Expander is great. I um I had it on my phone for a long time, and I resisted for the longest time setting it up on my Mac because I was like, oh, you know, it's just going to take too. It'll take too long to set up for me to actually use. And then once I set it up, it it was the, why haven't I been using this for the, the last three years? What have I been doing with my productivity? Uh, it is just so great. So uh, Text Expander 5 now suggests abbreviation, makes it even easier for you to find ways to save time. Uh, it's got a new Yosemite look and feel. Text Expander 3 plus custom keyboard is available for iPad and iPhone, so you can sync. Text Expander 5 costs $45.95. That might sound like a lot of money, but for something you use all day, every day, there's one thing that is more valuable than money, and that is time. You can never earn more time. Uh, and Text Expander, actually, sorry, Text Expander actually gives you time back. It is absolutely invaluable for me. I use it all the time. You can upgrade for $20, $19.95 for existing users, and it's free to anybody who purchased the previous version on or after January 1st, 2015. Text Expander 5 does require Yosemite, but it also just makes your life amazing. So that's what I want you to do. I want you to go to smilesoftware.com slash iMore, or just go and buy it. Um, and I, I, the referral is great because it makes them think you heard about it from the show, which is wonderful, but it's fantastic software. If you care at all about productivity and saving your time, just stop listening to me and go get it already. Phew. Word. Huh. All right, so one other thing I wanted to bring up, Brandon, it's mostly me complaining about the media again, is <laughs> over over the last week, a couple a couple of friends from the Apple Beat um, Sounds like they ended up going to work for Apple, which has happened in the past. But I don't understand. Like, 
these are normal people. They have the same rights, privacy as anybody else. They have their own personal lives. But this has been happening forever. I remember a couple of people went to work for HTC. A couple went to work for Samsung. I know people who went to work for Microsoft. Why get this just always happens, but it seems like it gets an inordinate amount of attention when it happens to Apple people. Well, in general, they want to cover anything that has to do with Apple news. And um, we're not immune to that. You know, I'm more also covers a lot of that stuff. Uh, but it, I think it's just a fascination of the people that Apple is hiring. I know there were a couple of years back, you know, a friend of mine um, who's a was a fairly accomplished security researcher got picked up by Apple. Um, and uh, there was there were articles about him, despite the fact that, you know, he's a, he's a security researcher. It's not necessarily something that the average user or even Wall Street needs to know about. But it was, you know, big headline. Oh, this person has been acquired, who has been picked up by Apple. And that's the same thing. You know, prominent journalists um, and, and, you know, you <laughs> uh, all of these, all of these people going to Apple in various in various capacities. I think people are trying, or at least the media uh, might be trying to paint a picture like, hmm, can we can we position from? It was like the car guy the other the other day who got hired to work at Apple. Oh well, we can tell by this guy's hiring because he used to do all of these things that this is what Apple's going to make. I don't know if you can necessarily make the same. Uh, calculated adjustment based on, oh, Apple's hiring journalists. Is Apple preparing to launch its own Apple news site? Uh, it's, it's people getting nervy. I think. Ultimately. Yeah. See, that's the part. See, uh, covering it as news, I think is fine. But I remember a couple of years ago, uh, they hired, they hired someone who had nothing in the company, had nothing to do with media. And it was like, oh, he's going to be live blogging all the Apple events. Now Apple's going to try and put the live bloggers out of work. Uh, and or, you know, the, they're hiring this person, they're, they're going to be curating Apple News or just there's some sort of far fetch. I, I, I don't mind the facts, but the, the speculation, it just seems like there is no plot. It, it reminds me of the West Wing where Josh invented an imaginary plan to fight Secret inflation plan to fight inflation yeah. and then no longer supported it. So ridiculous. Yeah, uh, no, exactly. It's just there are people who are very talented and very smart and Apple likes smart, talented people. That's that's Apple's MO is pick up people who are smarter and better at certain areas than, you know, than people they already have yeah. people that would fit into their circle and fit into their their narrative and make it work. And there are all sorts of indie developers who've gone to work for Apple as all sorts of indie developers who have left working at Apple. There's a bunch of people who with media backgrounds who went the, the current vice president of of corporate communications at Apple started off in mainstream media. Uh, people who have left Apple have been in mainstream media. It's it's sort of like the I, before I got this job at iMore, I worked in product marketing for an enterprise software company. It's not that unusual. People go where the opportunities is, and smart people want to be challenged. Uh, they wanted to try something new, and Apple's a company that can challenge you. So is Microsoft. So is Samsung. So is HTC. So is Wyget. So there's all sorts of uh, of these things. I just want to wish them all well and success. I agree. Huh. Anything else in the news? Anything I'm missing, Ren? No, I um, I think that's about it. Uh, Apple got a redesign. I like their oh, new, yeah. new website very much. I think it's pretty. I think it's that's good, super good interesting. Way. Yeah, um, of hiding all the things that they don't want people to see. I find it interesting that the refurbs are hidden even further down the page now. You can find them at the very bottom of Apple's website. So I guess the big news here, though, is that they, t they it used to almost be two separate sites. There was yes. apple.com and store.apple.com. And store apple.com sort of was this nice light HTML framework and store to apple.com was like this web objects thing had to be taken down for hours at a time in order to, eat, to do even basic updates. I don't know if it's still going to go down for an, like, does the whole site go down for an hour now and they want to update. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, yeah, that's, are we going to, is this the, is this the end of, is the store down post-its? Oh, the post -it. I guess we'll, we'll see in September. Apple Store is that yeah, and you basically instead of having the two separate sites, everything is commingled. So, the description page, I think Gruber uh, said it well. He said they used to have a showroom and then a separate buying area. Now, like like most places, the sh you can buy directly from the showroom, and it makes a ton of sense. It's more usable. It's more succinct. There's less duplication. It looks like a faster framework. Uh, and and they've the, the most um, interesting thing is they've got a two a two line hamburger button that sort of animates around and goes into an X which yeah. I think is very cute. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> and it works great on mobile. I mean, I, so far it's a good redesign. Mm -hmm. I like it a lot. And that's sort of the example we're talking about is that they didn't start taking apple.com apart and have a bunch of under construction signs. And then they just basically put up the new site. And hopefully when they do things like Apple Music or iTunes, that's what we'll see. Like the old iTunes will just go away and the new one will be there. And they've been building it 
like Swift building it behind the scenes for a while. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm hoping that it just sort of slides right into place. Yeah. And then everything will finally be perfect and no one will have anything to cop to complain about for Apple. Ever Definitely again. not. No one will ever complain because complaining is not what we do. No, never. Not at all. All right. And anything interesting coming up on the network? Let's see. Well, we had James Thompson last week. Uh, we're going to have Jason Snell this week and we're going to have uh, Mike Hurley in two weeks. Right. Uh, a little bit about podcasting. James Thompson was ridiculous. He was awesome. Yeah, he, uh, James wrote a post-apocalyptic story about uh, the value and the danger of the sh- value and danger of sharing, um, as well as advertising, and it's hilarious. It's very, very silly, but very awesome. Uh, he got some Twitter grief for the ad stuff, which I feel bad about because his yeah. his story about ads ended up being on a page with a lot of ads. Sad, sorry. Womp womp. Yeah, we're working on it, guys. We promise. It's not. It's not something that we uh, we necessarily love when yeah. when you guys have a bad ad experience. It's definitely you know every. Please keep on sending that feedback in because we take it very seriously. And every bit of feedback that you send, we send right up the chain and make sure that the people who uh, who need to see it get it get seen. So yeah. if you if you have a problem with our site, if our site is being weird, if our site is showing you a terrible ad, please screenshot it and send it to us. And actually some really cool people at uh, at Google uh, sent us a bunch of information on how to make a uh, performance better. And we've also, if you logged in now, we've removed a bunch of ads and the app still has no ads. So um, we're trying to do as many things as we can for it. For sure. Um, and, uh, so yeah, sorry, you said Jason Snell this week, the, all the incomparable Jason Snell, Jason Snell. The Jason Snell is this week followed by Mike Hurley. And, uh, hopefully we'll have Aline Sims on later to talk about app camp for girls. Um, we've got, let's see, Brianna Wu in the works. We've got Lisa Smizer, um, of the incomparable fame. And, uh, she, I'm, I'm not sure what she's working right now, but she, she does a lot of really great consumer tech. She does a fantastic newsletter, um, about smart saving and uh, modern lifestyle, which is just hilarious to read. Um, there's a lot of a lot of really great people coming down the works. Awesome. We had uh, my sister was in town um, last week, and I managed to corner her and get her to explain how she uses her Apple Watch at uh, a teaching hospital. And she's not an early adopter by any sense of the imagination, but their hospital switched to uh, and the uh, Apple push notification based paging system. So you basically get your page notification on your iPhone. And because women's clothing doesn't have a lot of pockets, she found it hard to carry it around. So she got a pebble, but that was noisy. And now she has the Apple Watch. And it was just fascinating to me to see how they're actually using that um, on the floor at the hospital. I thought that was really cool. This week, we have Virginia Roberts talking about accessibility for Apple Watch bands in a way mm-hmm. maybe you didn't consider previously. We have Steve Aquino, who's going to talk about using how uh, the Apple Watch makes Apple Pay more accessible. We have David Johnson doing another article on accessibility for us. We've got a bunch of accessibility stuff coming up. We've got a couple more uh, industry analysts doing pieces for us. So I'm really I'm really digging our column series. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, really happy with it. Yeah. <sighs> All right, Ren. Long story short, that's the podcast for this week. That is the podcast for this week. Tune in next week where I'm sure we'll talk more about our Apple Music Book and whatever drops from the Apple news cycle this week. Uh, hopefully a little bit later, I'm going to have uh, some posts up on if you get stuck, struck by a powder, hour, powder outage, <laughs> if you get struck by a power outage, how, uh, how can you deal with it without uh, resorting to candles and reading a book? Not a powder and reading, yeah. A, book a powder a book. outage is when that guy with the bald blue head suits you with lightning, right? Yes. Yes. All right. It's terrifying. Oh, having to read a book by candlelight. It sounds horrible, Ren. It sounds lovely. Actually, I did a little bit of reading. I, actually, I'll plug I'll plug a book that I've been reading recently, um, which is uh, Neil Stevenson's new book, Seven Eves. Uh, highly recommend, uh, especially it's ostensibly a post-apocalyptic book about the moon exploding. But it also has some really smart, really interesting social commentary about our increasing desire to build everything around the the lens of social currency mm. um, and social, you know, how how we project ourselves and how we project battles and occurrences and everything else. And I I am really really digging it. I recommend people read it. Awesome. And in future shows, we're going to try and get more guests on again. That's something yeah. fun that people have been asking about. Exactly. All right, Ren. So in the meantime, people want to find you on the interwebs. Where can they go? 
You can find me at Saturn, S-E-T-T-E-R-N, on Instagram and Twitter, as well as on imore.com. And pretty soon, they'll be able to find both of us on the iBookstore. Awesome. Can't wait. You can find me at Rene Ritchie. Uh, you can find all of us at iMore. I want to once again thank lynda.com for sponsoring this show. When you're looking to become an industry expert, you're passionate about a hobby, you just want to learn something new, go to lynda.com slash iMore and sign up for your free 10-day trial. That's L-Y-N-D-A.com slash I-O, sorry, I-M-O-R-E. I can spell the site name. I swear I can. Ah, oh, thanks so much, Ren. Thank you so much, everyone who's listening. If you haven't already, please go to iTunes. Please leave us a review and a rating. It helps encourage iTunes to feature us, which lets us find awesome, more additional awesome readers like yourselves. If you want to see the video version, go to youtube.com slash imorevideo, and we will be back later this very week. Bye. Bye, Ren. 